uh, the technical problems. And this is, um, so this is a bit of a, a test today. So first of all, hello and uh, welcome to another com uh, Foreman community demo. Uh, for questions, please reach out to us on Freenode IRC on, um, on Twitter. And today we are trying out a return to live streaming for the first time since the deprecation of Hangouts on Air. Feel free to add questions in the live stream comments as they will be monitored. If you have any problems with the live stream, just drop a comment on the live stream and, um, and someone will answer you there. And just before we begin, uh, there is just one announcement. So yesterday, Foreman 2.1 was branched um, and uh, Foreman 2.1 RC1 will be available next week. Um, if once the RC1 is available, any testing will be greatly appreciated to make the final release uh, stable. Uh, so now we can turn over to our first presentation from Rahul. Hey, thanks, Melody. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay, uh, so we had a demo about uh, the single sign-on in the previous demos, like I think two demos back I gave a demo about how to do single sign-on with Foreman, but if you don't remember we'll do a slight recap and then we will see uh, how to log out from an SSO session. So if you remember, if you've seen the demo, you might remember that we were still figuring out how to perform logout for uh, single sign-on users, but now since we figured it out, uh, this is the demo about it. So let's start so what i want to show you is the settings once you go inside Foreman settings as an admin user and into authentication if you remember uh, we used to uh, we need to fill up few fields like oidc audience the issuer the oidc J uh, jwks url and another important one is login delegation logout url so these four fields were required other than that um, for this uh, demo uh, we you need to set the idle timeout to two minutes because I don't want to set it to a lot of time so that we, we will have to wait for that. So you set the idle timeout to two minutes and uh, and then you try try to log in from the external user. So uh, how to do that? You just go on to your form in URL slash user slash ext login. If that is external login. Once you do that, it will redirect you to the Keycloak. Uh, for, so here, as an OpenID provider, I'm using Keycloak. So this will uh, redirect you to the Keycloak uh, login page. And the user that you have registered in Keycloak, you need to log in with that user. So once you log in, it will redirect you back to the phone page. And since I haven't given any permissions to this user, so this user has only permission to write page. If you log out, uh, since it's a single sign-on, you will have an option to again log in rather than you will not be directly logged out and you will not have to sign in again. That's the whole point of single sign-on. So you can, with a simple click, you can log in again. And if you notice the time right now, it's uh, it says 59 in the end. So I will just pause the recording for two minutes and then I come back at after two minutes uh, and start recording again. And now uh, a logout is performed and you will be redirected to the login page of the single sign-on, uh, like the OpenID provider that you're using. So that is Keycloak. So now you need to log in again. And once you log in from here, you will be redirected to the phone dashboard. So that's how the logout process for single sign-in sign users would work. So yeah, that's, that's all from my side. Thank you. Over to you, Melanie. Thanks very much, um, Rahul. Um, so up next is Andre with uh, Ansible Variables Import. Hi everyone. Uh, I would like to share with you. Uh, Actually, Andre, up. can we just stop for one sec? I forgot mm -hmm. um, if there's just questions. Um, is there any questions yeah. on the chat? We we'll just give one second for that, if that's okay. A few seconds. Sure. Sure. Uh, yeah, so the only question we have is actually to change the layout uh, that we're presenting. And Melanie, for you, 
I think you need to change the layout so they see this to Spotlight so they can see the whole screen because they're seeing the uh, Google Meet. They're seeing the Google Meet. Um, let me see now. So I'm in full screen. Um, I think it's the layout. If you change the layout of the meeting, maybe that would help. Layout. but not hearing our audio. Okay, can I somehow help it? No, I hear your audio, so I'm guessing it's something with the connection again. I think it's not, yeah, it is probably something with the connection at this stage. The, let me just check. Um... And now they can hear us again. Okay, okay. Sorry, sorry, Andre. This is uh, this no worries. Yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, the issue was uh, with uh, the same named variables in multiple multiple roles. When I go ahead, I will pick for this demo uh, Apple repository's name uh, variable and. You can see that I have it only in Apple repositories, but I will go ahead and add the variable by hand uh, to form and form and proxy, and we can see that uh, this is working, and it, this was working as well uh, before. But now, if I would go uh, to import the variables from my proxy, uh, the same named variables would previously uh, be over overriding themselves. So only one could be imported. So I would see only the first variable and uh, form and repositories, and it would say update, and what would effectively happen would be that the, the variable in my global var variables would just change the role update i can see that i have uh, i have new uh, apple repositories name for roles form and repositories i will import that one and i can see that i have uh, apple repositories name for form and proxy that says update, and this will update the default value of this uh, of this variable. So I will go ahead and update this, and I can see that I have a new variable per Apple repositories name for form and repositories, and the default variable default value for Apple repositories name is updated uh, for form and proxy. If I would go ahead and uh, change, I will share my terminal. So if I would go ahead and change the variable in uh, 
repositories. I will just go ahead and change the value for value. And I'll go back to my to my foreman. I will import from the local uh, local proxy. And I can see that in here I have an update of the of this variable, and it will uh, import the new new default value. That's, in my opinion, how it should work, and we agreed in upstream. But uh, this brings a challenge uh, for the users now that it's currently not solved, but we are working on it for next release. Because now I have three uh, same named variables, and I have uh, no idea in here because both of my um, my roles have the variable. I have no idea what value will this variable uh, variable have in the end. So that's a challenge we we are trying to solve uh, now and. We hope to solve it in the next release. Until then, keep that in mind. Thanks. That was everything from me. Thanks, Andre, and sorry for the um, disruptions. Um, yeah. are, we'll just wait for a few uh, seconds to see, are there any um, questions or any further issues? No questions so far and no new issues. Thank you. Cool. Um, Okie doke. So up next is Maria. Yeah, hi. Uh, one second. Can you see my screen? Perfect. Yeah. So in the reoccurring logics, you have the ability to cancel the reoccurring logics. And now we added a button that will delete all the canceled reoccurring logics that you have. This will delete them completely and not archive them in any way. Here are a few canceled ones. And when I click it, you will get a confirmation and it will just remove everything that is clear and cancelled. This is for recurring logics and for tasks. There was the option to select all the page, but now there is also the option to select all the tasks that are for this search. So for this search, I have action equals runs hosts. It also takes into consideration the active filters that you have, if you have any. And you just have to select all 67 tasks. And you can bulk action, cancel, or resume. Uh, if you unselect one, then it will remove the select all. So you can only select everything and not pick and choose. Because this action might take a while, the when it finishes, it will not send a toast notification, but it will send a regular notification, and it will look like that. It will tell you which ta how much tasks were canceled and how much of the tasks were not cancelable, so they were skipped. And yeah, that's it for me. Just two small enhancements. That's great, Maria. Thank you. So Ori, how are things over there? I don't see any questions for now. We can move on. Great, thank you. So up next is Dominic. Who's okay, hello. 
My name is Dominic, and I'm going to show you something about a uh, new feature. That's about uh, possibility of disabled user. Everyone see the screen of mine? Yeah, it's, it's there. OK. So uh, I have two users in my Foreman instance. One is administrator. The next one is the test user. And uh, I can I can mark them as disabled, and that means that this user is still exists in Foreman instance, but it's not able to log in to the system. So it can be used for some security reasons and a couple of things like that. And when I look out, and I will try lock as the Test user that I that is disabled right now, and I hope I set up correct password. Yes, I set up. I mm, typed correct password, and the foreman shows me that the user account is disabled. So I should, unless come like contact my administrator, I'll ask him why is uh, my account is disabled. But because I'm at the admin, I can uh, 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 delete the disable of user and make it working again. So let me show you. Oh, back to the users. Just user. We'll mark that. Submit. Now I am able to log in as test user. Yes. And now I log in. It's working for uh, it's working for normal format instance, and it should work also with uh, single sign-on and our other systems that are connected to the format with login, and also the hammer. Uh, it also and also it should work with Hammer and uh, API uh, request, so be aware. Uh, and uh, the support for that in Hammer it will be very soon. That's all from me. Thank you, Dominic. Um, anything, Ori? No questions for Dominic yet, but we have a question for Maria. Um, is the clear also clear all available also through Hammer? Yeah, in Hammer CLI, you can clear, I mean, delete all the tasks that are either canceled or finished. All the recurring logics that are canceled or finished. Thank you. That's all we have for now. Thank you, Ori. Um, so next up, we have Jeremy um, with the first of the Catello presentations. Thank you, Melanie. Uh, can you hear me? Loud and clear. OK, great. And uh, so I'm Jeremy. I'm in the Catello team. I want to share with you a feature we've been working on around email notifications for subscriptions that are expiring soon. Uh, so there's, there's two parts to this. The first part is we've updated the entitlement report. Um, so if you see, if you go to the report templates page and the entitlement report, uh, and you go to generate, uh, you can see we've added a new input, uh, which is days from now. And you can select no limit, and you'll get the same entitlement report that you've always gotten. Or you can select a number of days as the limit. So say you wanted to sh the report to show only subscriptions that are expiring within the next 30 days, you can do that. And uh, I'm, I'm going to choose HTML here because it's a little bit easier to see on the screen. But anyway, once we submit this, it's going to run the report task. And it brings you to this download page here, and it, it will um, give you a report that looks like this. I'm going to share this tab now. Can you see my report? 
Yeah. Okay, so you see on this report, we've added a column on the right here for days remaining, and you can see how many days are remaining in each of these uh, subscriptions. You'll see all of these are 15, 21 days. I selected 30 days, so this only shows subscriptions expiring in less than that. Um, so the second part of that feature that we've added is that there's a new email notification that you can add. Uh, if you go to My Account and Email Preferences, uh, can you all see this still? Yep. OK, good. And you can see that we've added the subscriptions expiring soon here. You can choose to receive this email daily, weekly, or monthly, just like any other email notification. And then you choose the, uh, the number of days here. And once you do that, you get an email that looks like this. And you'll see here it, it lists, this email just lists subscriptions. It does not list the hosts. Uh, so hopefully it'll be a, a shorter email than the report. Uh, but you can see the days remaining here as well. And then at the bottom of the email, there is a link to view a report of the affected hosts. And um, that will take you to the report that I just showed you. It actually starts the report task when it sends the email. So hopefully by the time you've gotten the email, the report will be done and ready for download, which it is. Um, and if it's not, that's no big deal too. It'll take you to this same page here and you can download the report. Here is the uh, CSV version of the report and you can see the days remaining here. Uh, so that is all from me. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, so we'll just give a minute for questions. No questions at the moment. And nothing from the previous demo either. Okay. Yeah. Okay, doc. Um, so then, if that's the case, we can move on to to Chris with Tracer UI. Alrighty. Let me share my screen here. Oh wait, tell Jeremy on present. Oh, there you go, Chris. All right, Sorry. All right let me um, go ahead and share this. Um, so, can you go ahead? Can you go ahead and see this? Okay. Yep, yeah, can see it. Okay. So a couple of things we've been making a lot of uh, improvements on Tracer. Um, so one of the I've got a few clients here. And we're gonna hopefully this will work. It's all live demos. Um, I tested it last night. So the first thing I wanted to show everybody is um, I know in the last demo we showed if Tracer was not installed on a client we would have a um, basically just a not installed. Um, and Jonathan added the ability to actually install Tracer with remote execution right from here. So we're gonna install Tracer on this guy right here and we're gonna perform it remote execution. And that should hopefully work. It'll take just a second. Um, if the live demo guys are, are happy with me. Um, and so um, we'll come back to that guy here in just a second um, where it might, Yeah, we'll come back to that guy. So open up another one. Um, so the next thing is, is we've also added the ability because not, you know, going through doing that one by one for traces is not really um, beneficial. So we've added the ability now to actually um, install and remediate traces with multiple hosts. So what we can do now is we can go ahead and select these two guys. These two guys are have traces on them. So we're gonna go ahead and go manage host traces. And um, if they, if you do not have remote execution installed, a box will pop up here saying that you need to install the feature or turn on the um, feature with the installer. Um, so what we do is we can actually, we'll go ahead and support this or run through these guys. Now, one thing I wanted to show is if you actually select something that's gonna reboot your computer, they come up and say um, both on the bulk host and on the single host, it'll actually say in red this. Um, so I'll show you what that looks like here on one of these on the single host page. 
So if I go to this guy and restart, you'll see that um, we get a nice bold logo saying that this is going to reboot the host. Um, so let me go back to the bulk host tracers. And look, and this guy finished so that we can actually install Tracer right from the UI as long as remote execution is set up correctly. Um, so let me go back and we're going to go ahead and remediate some traces. Um, this is nightly, so I apologize if there's some. There we go. We'll just do that. We're going to go ahead and manage some traces. So we'll do this guy. And I'm going to go ahead and restart selected. And you'll see that we have a confirmation box. We'll go ahead and restart. It, is, it will kick off all the jobs that are needed. And we can actually click right here. And we can go see all the different jobs that are running for each of those hosts. Um, and we can actually go and inspect the job then. And that job has been done. And that basically was a restart of TuneD. And we do a Catello Tracer upload then. One of the other things that's really been that's been nice too is now we can actually look at a host status and we can see this is a host. Um, if we query the API on a host, we can see everything about the host. And now we actually have a um, a trace status, so you can see if a trace has been is needed on a host or not. Um, I'm currently adding this into Hammer, um, but we did add this. Uh, it came up in the community support, and Jonathan went through and added that. Um, but I am adding the Hammer part of it too. Um, and um, I think those, both those guys have finished. Yep, both of them have successfully completed. Um, and that's kind of all I had. Was there any questions on that? We're not getting questions so far. OK. Might get some a little later. OK, thank you. Yeah, definitely. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, we can go back to any any questions that that might come up. So, um, next is um, Ian with the uh, Yum appl applicability. All right, hello everyone. I'm going to present my screen. Okay, hi everyone. It's Ian here. Um, I so I have. Another feature here that's related to the Pulp 3 um, upgrade that we're going to be doing soon. It's in progress right now. You can see there that the, in uh, the latest Catello there are, you can deal with the Docker and container content, but we're still working on the Yum related stuff. And this is another part of that. So as part of Pulp 3, uh, Pulp 3 will no longer manage RPM errata module applicability for us. So now we are doing a new feature where Catello will handle this instead. So what's nice is that Catello almost had all, pretty much had all the information that we needed to calculate the applicability. We just needed to organize it in a better manner um, so that the performance is better and that it's not as complex. So the first thing that we had to do for the applicability, we had to create a new custom Postgres extension. And the extension introduces this new EVRT type. And essentially what it is, it's a grouping of the epoch, the version, and then the release for either an RPM or uh, an installed package. And then what's really nice about this EVRT type is that you can just compare the versions for two packages um, using like a greater than symbol uh, in the SQL syntax. And that makes it incredibly easy to see if a package is newer than another one. So just going into how we actually calculate this applicability. Um, so for the RPM, essentially we fetch all RPMs that firstly share a name and an architecture with any installed package on the host, and also has a, a greater EVR epoch version release. 
Secondly, it has to exist in the host's bound repositories. So those are the repositories that the host is subscribed to. And then thirdly, um, it needs to exist in the host enabled module streams for any RPMs that are modular. So the modularity has a bit of an effect here on the applicability as well. So then we also have our errata applicability. Now errata applicability comes very easy after you calculate the applicability for RPMs. Essentially, you just need to fetch all the errata that are attached to the host's applicable packages. And we ha currently have a PR in to do the modular applicability that is coming, but it's more or less the same thing as the errata applicability. Um, you need to fetch the uh, all the, the module streams um, that are attached to the host applicable packages because if if uh, a modular package is applicable, that means that the module is installed, so you have information there. So I'm just going to give a quick little demo just to show what this looks like. Um, I'm not showing in Catello because it looks it'll look just the same as if you're doing applicability with Pulp 2. Um, to enable this, you just need to go into your Catello settings, and then you just turn the Catello applicability to true. Now this won't fully work um, for Pulp 3 with modularity-related things because there's a new relation between modules and RPMs um, in Pulp 3 that we're relying on. And this is made mostly for Pulp 3 anyway, but you can test it out with Pulp 2. OK, so to start this off, um, I have this is my console here on my Catello server. And then I also have, uh, I have an EL8 um, client here. I'm not showing the modularity stuff um, today, but I'll just show the RPMs and errata. So to give this a test, we'll first install my Walrus package on the client. So that is installed. Now we'll go down to the console, and we will check this. OK, so firstly, I had to calculate the, the bound repositories. I have that already in here. So we will run this method called applicable differences on our new applicable content helper. What this will do is it will calculate all the applicable packages, and then it will also check what's already um, on the host for applicable packages. So if we run this, you see it returns an array with two arrays in it. The first array are uh, is content that should be added. So this ID 52, and you can see there's nothing that should be removed. So if we check out this 52, you see it's our walrus package. So then all I need to do to add that is I need to calculate and import the RPM applicability, returns nothing. And then if I do applicable differences again, you see nothing's there because now it's on the host. So we can, now that the RPM applicability is calculated, we can do something similar for errata. So if we look up the applicable differences for errata, you see now there's this errata that's 11. So if I do, we look at the erratum, we see this is the one that corresponds to my walrus package. So now we can just calculate and import the errata, and then we'll look at applicable differences again, and there's nothing there anymore. So now if we go to the host, let's see. So we have our host. If I look at the applicable RPMs, if I scroll down, let's see. Actually, it'll be easier. I'll just show, let me show the uh, errata. Yeah, OK. So on the applicable errata, we have the C erratum that's added to the host, which means that the RPM must be on there as an applicable package anyway. So that's pretty much it, what I have for the demo here, just to show um, uh, the current status. So I mentioned that the modularity one is coming. So we have a PR up for that. And then soon, we also have some performance increases coming. Currently, when we perform the, uh, we regenerate the applicability, um, it just does it one task per host. 
And that's been a bit slow because there's an overhead for creating the task. So now we have a new PR to actually have a, a queue of hosts that need their applicabilities regenerated so that we can just pull from that queue and regenerate the applicability for a whole bunch of hosts at a time. So hopefully at some later community demo, I can show uh, the applicability feature fully finished. And that's it. Thank you. I don't see any questions so far. OK. Yeah. I, my computer just had a moment, but I think everything is OK. So if there is no question, it's uh, Jonathan next with two, two different um, demos. All right, thank you, Melanie. Um, my screen should be sharing. Wow, I've got some big shoes to fill here with all these great demos today. Um, we'll see how it goes. So the first one I want to demo or share with you today is kind of an architectural win for us in Catello. And you may be familiar with what I'm about to speak about if you caught this RFC in the, in the discourse, which I'm sharing on my screen now. I'll give, give a quick summary of what this was all about. So with Catello 4.0, we're making a switch wholesale from Pulp 2 to Pulp 3. And we wanted to think about what are some things we could do in advance of that such as in the Catello 316 release now, which is reaching RC phase, to um, make that transition easier, having less moving parts in that release from 316 to 4.0. So it turns out that um, in Pulp 2, there was a, the Cupid message broker. It's a component that Pulp 2, 2 uses internally, but we are also using it um, to receive and process messages from Candlepin, which is another component of Catello. Candlepin has an internal message broker called Artemis, which connects to Cupid, and Catello connects to Cupid, and we receive messages through that flow. Obviously, with Pulp 2 going away, um, Cupid would also be going away, or rather, we didn't want to keep it around if we didn't have to. So we thought about what are our options here, and we went with the option of connecting to Artemis directly from Catello <clears throat> to the embedded Artemis within Candlepin. And uh, that decision was basically the result of this RFC, where I got a lot of great feedback. And today, I can share with you that all of this work is completed and will be shipped in Catello 316. And you may have already seen it um, in Nightly's if you've been experimenting. So I just wanted to give a kind of a demonstration of you know what what is the real end result of of this switchover. And really, from the user's perspective, there there isn't much of a change, and and that's kind of the goal. But I just wanted to show you one case where we are processing messages from Candlepin and doing something in Catello um, through, that, through that asynchronous activity. Uh, one such case is when we attach a subscription to a host. Um, we get several messages around entitlements being created in Candlepin and compliance events being processed. So before I attach a subscription here, I want to show you um, in my console one thing that you may observe as a result of the switchover is if you are a keen observer of your Catello logs, um, you'll be seeing this statement on my screen here um, when the server boots up. This is uh, at the point of the connection to Artemis being established. And one thing that we added this time around was um, the ability to check the status of the candle pin event processing through hammer ping. So that shows up as a field now. We can see that since my arrest started up, I've processed 27 events, zero of which has failed, which is really good. So if I come and attach a subscription now, like I mentioned before, we should get some additional events coming by. I'll attach this one here. All right, that's attached. And um, let's see what Hammer Ping tells us now. Ah, I've got 31 events processed. Um, and like I said, those events are around Gatello's um, need to know about that entitlement being created in Candlepin and to recalculate the uh, system's compliance and, and store that value in our own database. So um, that's basically it for the Artemis portion. Before I conclude, I want to give a huge thank you to everyone who left feedback on this RFC. 
to the Candlepin team who had to make um, some changes for us in order to maintain the exact features that we had with Cupid and um, the release team who had to do some installer work for us to achieve this and everyone on my team who left feedback on the pull requests involved. Um, so that's it for this demo. Uh, Melanie, are there any questions about this? Uh, I don't see any questions. We'll right, see great. if uh, maybe they'll arrive at the end of the next demo. All right. Um, I'll be here to answer those. So yeah, I'll move right into my next one, which is around simple content access in 316. And I want to give a quick recap of what simple content access is. And simple content access is a relaxed mode of um, retrieving content on your systems. So rather than going through the flow of attaching subscriptions and um, things like that across however many hosts you may have, simple content access allows you to um, not attach any subscriptions and grant you access to all the content within an organization based on the repositories that you've enabled or not. Now, um, we made some improvements on simple content access in 316, mostly just around visual cues explaining um, different aspects of the feature, disabling certain things that um, we don't need to do anymore, and um, just kind of making the experience a little bit smoother. So I'm going to switch my organization here to my simple content org to show some of those changes. Something you'll see on several pages now in the simple content access mode um, is this banner right here. And this is just a reminder to those who may not be familiar with the feature or may not be aware of their organization administrator having switched them into simple content access that something has changed and to give an indicator of what that change implies. So this message is basically saying that, you know, your content host can consume from all content views. I'm sorry, all repositories within the content view that's associated to the host regardless of any subscriptions being attached. And additionally, um, in the manage manifest modal, we show whether simple content access is enabled. And we show that here because this is enabled th through the manifest that's imported if you're a Red Hat customer with Red Hat subscriptions. In the future, we would, um, just to show you kind of what we're thinking about, we want to allow the ability to toggle this simple content access from here, but we're not quite at that point yet. One other thing that we've done um, in 316 is around auto attach. If we're not attaching subscriptions, well, the, the idea of auto attaching subscriptions is kind of unnecessary. So we've done some things in the UI to, to make that apparent. My environment is a little slow today. Let's uh, stop and reload again. Maybe that'll work. Hmm. All right, bear with me for just one second. Let me take a look at my log, see if anything is uh, apparent here. Okay, I'm gonna restart my Rails server, but I will talk about these changes um, in the meantime. So like I said, we've uh, improved the experience around um, auto-attach, meaning that wherever on the UI we would have shown auto-attaching, for example, on an activation key or on the content host subscriptions, we are simply saying that this feature is disabled um, because, again, there is no need to attach a subscription in simple content access. Similarly, if you are using subscription manager on a client to run auto-attach, or if you're using Hammer on the Catello server directly to run auto attach, you're going to get a friendly message that says, you know, you don't really need to be doing this. I think my server is back up now. Oh, 
All right, um, my UI seems a bit slow, but let's see if the uh, the client side is working. So as I was saying, um, if you're using Hammer to run auto-attach, we're going to get a friendly message now. So let's see if that is the case here. Ah, and it is the case. So um, this organization, or this host number eight here, is in this organization, which I've been showing on the UI. And we're getting this message now that simple content access is uh, enabled, so auto-attach is disabled. OK, here we go. UI is loaded now. Sorry about that. Um, so over here on subscriptions tab for an activation key, we show that auto attach is not applicable because we're in simple content access mode. Again, we have this banner showing up here. And similarly on a content host details, we're going to get a similar experience. So there we go, auto attach is not applicable. And again, we have that banner just to kind of get folks used to this idea of being in simple content access and what that entails. And um, that's all I had for what's coming up in 316 for simple content access. Um, are there any questions? We don't have questions at the moment, uh, but I did get a message that our delay uh, is a little longer than usual. So for everyone watching live, if you do have questions and we don't get to them because of the delay, everyone will be on our, our IRC channels later and we'll be happy to answer you there. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to answer any questions on IRC. And uh, thanks, that's all I had. Thanks so much, Jonathan. Um, so then we have one presentation, one demo left um, from John Mitch. On the, on the new content view uh, page progress. Yeah, thanks, Melanie. Hey, everyone. Let me share my screen. All right. So we in Catello have decided to rewrite the content view page. Um, we are rewriting it in Pattern 5.4, which is part of uh, this change that's been introduced in Foreman, and we've been able to use it in Catello. Um, and it's written in React uh, as well, as a lot of our new pages, or pretty much all of our new pages are now written in React. Um, here is the, the, first, uh, uh, the first major contribution to that, or the first major um, uh, change. Uh, it's just adding a table that list the content views. Um, so I'd like to just share the progress of that and maybe a little bit of what that's going to look like as it gets built out. Um, and I'll be continually sharing the progress and uh, as more features get merged. Right now, it's just a simple table. There's no search or pagination yet or anything like, or header or anything like that. Uh, just the goal is to get the content views listed on screen. Um, these are real content views. You can see here's the old page with all the content views. Um, these are media names. I used like a, a, a name faking library <laughs> to see the data. Um, so one of the goals of this page is to get the, the information on this main table uh, easily accessible. So we have these drop downs for environments, repositories, and versions. And you can see they're not filled out yet. That will be coming. Uh, but the idea is these are going to be truncated lists, um, especially in the case of like versions and things like that, um, of your most recent versions or uh, kind of the main repositories in the content view um, and the environments, some way of displaying the information of what environment the content view is in. This change came from speaking with users, and their feedback was they don't want to keep drilling down into the content view getting information, going back out, uh, and keep having to navigate through the UI that way. It can be kind of frustrating. So this doesn't really show a ton of information here. You have to go into the content view and get the information. So that's going to be the goal. And then there's going to be a details uh, page. This will be a link here uh, to the details page. Um, and the, the other part is there is the, this composite uh, the composite content views will be shown with this icon here. Um, that will be the main difference there. Uh, and yeah, that's pretty much it. I'll, I'll definitely be coming to more demos and sharing progress as this gets updated.
Sí. John, thanks very much for that. Um, Ori, have there been any additional questions anywhere? Nope. Cool. And I think that's that's everything from from everyone. So um, first of all, uh, first thing is I just would like to thank all of you who presented today because it's been a bit of a, um, the, especially those who came first, um, it has been a bit of a ride. Um, so thank you very much, and thanks to everyone who has um, everyone who has been watching on on the live stream. Uh, really appreciate it. So. Okay, I'm gonna stop now.